Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I rise in support of the Appropriation Bill 2024-25. Of course, like colleagues before me, I want to express thanks to my family for another year of support and encouragement. Special thanks to my constituency executive for always being there with me and for me. And I have to mention my chairman, Mr. Paul, uh, my past chairman, Mr. Curtin, Baggio, Malaika, Sherian, all the persons who are in the office day in, day out, you know, the executive, my women's group, Mr. Speaker. I must say a very special thank you to Alison and, and the team. Um, my youth group, Mr. Speaker, and very soon we'll be having our Spelling Bee competition, and I invite all my colleagues to join me. My pageant committee, Mr. Speaker, very soon we will be hosting our pageant in Sisera, and of course, Carnival in Sisera. And I, again, I invite all my colleagues to join us. So very special thanks to all those who are making this happen, Mr. Speaker. So, Speaker, I also remember all the stalwarts who left us um, this year and passed on to, to the great beyond. I must mention Stephen Alexander Tupac um, from Hospital Road, Mr. Speaker, was one of my canvassers, very special individual. He actually left without you and I having a special meeting to you know, catch up on a few misunderstandings, Mr. Speaker. We had promised to meet the next day, and he died that same night. Um, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank my colleagues for the tremendous camaraderie and support that we give to each other. I, on Monday mornings, I look forward to going to cabinet meetings to meet with my, my comrades for us to, you know, Mr. Speaker, for us to discuss the business of this country. And despite all, Mr. Speaker, the maliciousness and the vindictiveness, as a team, Mr. Speaker, we work well together. We enjoy each other's company, Mr. Speaker. And I have to say to them that I am grateful for another year of the hard work, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this budget is a special one. In fact, when the member from Castries East was presenting, I sat listening to him, Mr. Speaker. And at one point, Mr. Speaker, I actually got goosebumps, Mr. Speaker. I did. And I'll explain to you why, Mr. Speaker. It brought back memories of the leader of the opposition. When asked why he had lost the election, he said that his race had betrayed him. And you try to understand what he meant by that. I don't think he was really referring to race in a, race in a racial context. But the people he believed that he represents had betrayed him. Think about that. The people he believed he represents had betrayed him. So they did not get what they wanted from him. Probably he took everything for himself. So they betrayed him, Mr. Speaker. And then I remember also he said colonialism had a conscience. What did he mean by that? It means that the people he had to serve, he did not see they as deprived, as disadvantaged, and as dispossessed as it is made out to be. Because after all, colonialism had a conscience. It did take care of them. So when you start mixing somebody who said these people betrayed him, colonialism had a conscience, and then when he started off as prime minister, he said, I wanted to be a CEO prime minister. I want to run this country like a business. It tells you what he thinks of St. Lucians. When he tells you that our patrimony is measured by our credit rating, what does he say to us? Do you remember his famous words about letting the jackasses bray and backing dogs? You see, Mr. Speaker, I'm reminding you of all those things because they define who he is, the leader that we had in this country. The same person who wishes you to choose him again as leader, but has a leopard changed its spots? And I will come back to this a little later on, Mr. Speaker. But let's compare him to our present leader. I am proud that the member from Castries East has chosen me to be a member of his cabinet. And it is also a singular honor to be his deputy and to work with him, Mr. Speaker. You see, 
The member from Kasuzi's Prime Minister understands social justice. It is why in this budget, the pensioners are taken care of. We still get laptops, school fees are paid, home care is provided, and I can go on and on because he understands that equality and empowerment can only be achieved when each person has an equal opportunity to achieve his dreams and aspirations. He understands that we can end poverty only when we establish an economic environment for each person to have a fair chance to create wealth and share in the national pie. You know, a friend said to me, do you know what PJP stands for? Especially after the delivery of this budget. And he says, P for people, J for justice, and P for progress. So PJP stands for people, then justice, then progress. Mr. Speaker, you see, there are those who pretend to be economists and development bankers and all the attributes they claim they have, but they never really, they never really got. For, for our political leader, our prime minister, the member from Catrice is, he's not about figures or pretensions of being an economist. He does not need to. His humanity makes him the best economist you can find. His love for people and improving their social and economic circumstances is the only statistic that matters to him. And of course, his unflinching determination to transform the lives of our people is the only social and economic review that matters. So all those figures and all those comparisons of growth and surpluses can mean nothing if you cannot put people at the center of your development. And that is what he's about. So our leader is a man of the people, from the people, and for the people. You see, this budget, Mr. Speaker, in many ways is an advancement on many budgets that were prepared before by various Labour Party administrations. It is full of compassion and concern for the people of St. Lucia. And not just one set, Mr. Speaker, just not those who control the apparatus of this country. It has something for everyone. The professional, the working class, the dispossessed, the, the entrepreneur. Every single group in St. Lucia can point in his budget and say there is something there for me. Think about it. Every single one, whether it's the business place that has to get exemption, uh, the, the tax am amnesty will extend to, whether it is the pensioner, whether it's the young man, the sportsman, all across St. Lucia, every strata, every grouping can see that this government cares about us and we are, can see our reflection in this budget. But you know what? The budget did not even say everything. The Prime Minister wants to be cautious and he will only announce things that he is so sure. And in fact, he, he, or like somebody said, it has to be a sorted in ceremony first for him to announce it. But because there's a lot more, Mr. Speaker. You know, I, I want to go through the, the budget, Mr. Speaker. Between page four to nine, 36 highlights of achievement. 36 between page four and nine. And I could add a few to him, for, to, to it. For example, we did not even include five million dollars for grants under the CTA. We did not even include that we brought back jazz and arts festival. We didn't include it. And by the way, as we speak of jazz and arts, let me make it very clear that all parliamentary representatives have gotten their jazz tickets. So please do not contact me, send me messages to ask me for jazz tickets. Contact your parliamentary representative. So the, all of them, all my colleagues have received their, their tickets. So I'm not responsible anymore. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we did not even add as a highlight bringing, establishing emancipation as a national celebration in St. Lucia. That didn't exist before. We didn't even speak about the flower festivals. And I can go on and on and add to the 36 and you'll quickly reach 100 and continue, Mr. Speaker. So even that budget, as glorious as it was, is a truncated budget, Mr. Speaker. I even saw so many things in there, Mr. Speaker, that Cassius South 
will benefit from. On page 20, GI Net, Mr. Speaker, I can boast that almost the entire constituency of Cash South will be covered within the next year or so because of the GI Net program, Mr. Speaker. And I can compare that to what happened under the previous administration, where in Cicero there was Wi-Fi and it was terminated, Mr. Speaker, because they were not paying for some you know, electricity bill or something, Mr. Speaker. I can boast that we will be fully covered. Page 21, land rationalization. This year, Mr. Speaker, will be a big year for Cash South, for Goodlands, for Mon Talk, for Bannon, Mr. Speaker. And I know the member from Catholic North knows Mon Talk very well, Mr. Speaker. He does. And it will be our year for us to be giving the citizens who have been living on those lands for 35, 40, 50 years finally a chance to own the land that they've lived on. Mr. Speaker, page 22 to 24, health facilities, you heard the member from Gifford North indicate that there is provision and this year they will be undertaking site identification for a new um, health facility in Cicero, Mr. Speaker. And I'm very excited about it, Mr. Speaker. Page 33, sports infrastructure. You heard the member from Grosley speak about the Cicero playing field. Mr. Speaker, we'll also be doing some work on the Banan, the small Banan playing field, Mr. Speaker. And my hope is that we can put a small pavilion which can also be used, you know, to house a pan side, Mr. Speaker. You know, Fuashio, Mr. Speaker, will finally get its court this year, Mr. Speaker. And the Prime Minister did not even have to mention it. There's a lot more, Mr. Speaker. Page 35 of the address, Mr. Speaker, speaks of community centers. The Basta Joseph Community Center will be completed and we will open it in July to commemorate our third anniversary of winning the elections, Mr. Speaker. The third, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, and I'm also hoping. Uh, we do carry as it. I'm also hoping, Mr. Speaker, we can make the process to get Cicero, a new community center, going. And page 50 spoke of roads, Mr. Speaker. And it was, a, it was quite noticeable that when Castries South was being mentioned earlier, we happened to be mixed up with Castries East and Castries North. But I think that's a good sign, Mr. Speaker. So we too are looking for our share of the roads. So there's so much in the budget at a constituency level and across various you know, strata of society. So I'm excited, Mr. Speaker, and I'm anxious for us to get going and implement the budget, Mr. Speaker. I want to start off, Mr. Speaker, to focus on the ministry that I lead. And I want to also, Mr. Speaker, take the opportunity to thank the Permanent Secretary, the Deputy Permanent Secretary, the Head of Departments, and everyone at the ministry, at the Cultural Development Foundation, at the St. Lucia Tourism Authority, you know, at Community Tourism, you know, agency at the NCA, Mr. Speaker, at the CIP, at Invest St. Lucia, for the collaboration and the support that they give to me, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, let's start with the creative industries. The cultural policy in St. Lucia has been outdated, having been in existence since 2000, Mr. Speaker. We had hoped to, to do a lot more work on it, but we focus a lot on the Tourism Development Act, Mr. Speaker. But now we've gotten that out of the way. Now we've gotten the Community Tourism Act out of the way, Mr. Speaker. We can now turn our attention to the Cultural Policy and a new um, Creative Industries Act in St. Lucia. It will be revolutionary, Mr. Speaker. Just as we made the Community Tourism a revolutionary piece of legislation, we made the Tourism Development Act a revolutionary piece of legislation, we will do the same, Mr. Speaker, for the creative industries and cult cultural industries, Mr. Speaker. So it will really set the framework, Mr. Speaker, for us to be able to you know, harness the creativity of our people and ensure that we can preserve our traditions and conserve many of our traditions, but also allow for socioeconomic development, Mr. Speaker. This year, Mr. Speaker, and I stated so in the estimates, we got a lot more uh, uh, in our allocation to ensure that we can do a lot more for the development of the creative industries, Mr. Speaker. So you will see the CDF involving in a, quite a few of cultural education and training programs. 
We spoke, and the Prime Minister did so in his budget, Mr. Speaker, of the development of youth in Silpan in various communities. And he indicated that in Masha, we'll be seeing the um, establishment of a pan shed for the revival of pan with the diamond still, Mr. Speaker. And it will not only be done in Masha. Marshall will probably be the first one, but there will also be support given to canneries, Mr. Speaker. I mentioned Banan. I hope Banan can get something, Mr. Speaker. I know that in Denry North, the Honorable Minister for Education has started a fun, some fun program, and he too will get support. And we will provide as much support as we can for the young people throughout the island, in library, whichever constituency that they we, we need some support, Mr. Speaker. We will certainly be providing it. The Prime Minister in his budget address spoke of support for lyric writing, Mr. Speaker. And it is something I'm really excited about, how we can bring some of our best young writers, Mr. Speaker, and for them to explore the craft of community, communicating ideas through song and the use of specific techniques, such as woodcraft, word choice, rhyme, use of melody, and all the different techniques that are used to ensure that we can produce some of the best um, soca and calypso music um, in the region. In the area of dance, Mr. Speaker, a lot will be invested in to develop choreography, choreography Mr. Speaker, and to facilitate some of the advanced technical knowledge that's in, involved in dance, Mr. Speaker. We have some fantastic dancers, and may, some of you would remember many years ago the number of dance troops we had in St. Lucia and the quality of dancing we had, Mr. Speaker. And we will be spending more money to develop it. We will be doing a train the trainers with the hope that they too can disseminate that knowledge and we can revive dancing to the levels that it was before, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we'll continue our work in terms of the f uh, promoting the festivals of St. Lucia. The flower festivals are unique to St. Lucia. There's no other place in the world, Mr. Speaker, you can find a La Rose and a La Marguerite, Mr. Speaker. It is rooted in the identity of who we are as St. Lucians. And since we got into office in July 2021, we've put a lot of effort to create you know, a heightened level of interest. And this year, we will be intensifying this to make sure that throughout the island, in all the major areas, we cannot accept that Beaufort North is not a major player you know, if La Rosa and La Marguerite. We cannot accept that Babono is not a major player, Mr. Speaker. So the team at CDF will be going out to the various communities to provide support for us to rebuild those groups, Mr. Speaker, and to ensure that our flower festivals grow even, um, you know, bigger than, they, than it is right now. The visual and literary arts component, Mr. Speaker, again, there will be major investment, Mr. Speaker, developing creative writing skills and to ensure that our young writers, Mr. Speaker, and persons who are involved in non-traditional publications for print and electronic media can receive advanced training. Painting and sculpting, Mr. Speaker, is another big one for us. We believe that you know, we have tremendous skills in this country, and we want to be able to provide more training again to a lot of young sculptors and painters. And I want to take the opportunity, Mr. Speaker, to invite you and all members of this Honorable House to visit the exhibition at the Orange Grove Plaza, put on by uh, Mr. Xavier. It is going to be a masterpiece. From all indications, what is being prepared for, for uh, public viewing will, will never have been seen in St. Lucia before. And I would want all of you to make some time next week to visit the exhibition. Art in public spaces, Mr. Speaker, is going to be continued. And I want to take this opportunity to thank the member for Castries Central, the Minister of Housing, for the work that he has been doing in his constituency, promoting art in public spaces. You can see the newly constructed vending booths behind, by right outside us, Mr. Speaker, how it is the use of the murals to, to, to highlight you know, the beauty of what's been done and, and many places in Castries Central. And I want to say to parliamentary reps to do more of that in your constituency, promote art in public spaces, give our young people the tools, the paint, and allow them to express themselves in whatever space they can get, Mr. Speaker. It, it is a very um, significant part of a civilization saying who they are and what they are about through art, and to do it no better place than in public spaces, Mr. Speaker. 
Mr. Speaker, the, in terms of theater, again, we, we almost completed with our renovations of the cultural center, and very soon the CDF will be meeting stakeholders to talk about the use of the cultural center and ensuring that we can preserve it as much as possible. But again, it will state that we'll put more emphasis on that aspect of our creative expression. You know, Mr. Speaker, there are quite a few um, traditional folk practices from masquerade and, you know, su such, Mr. Speaker, that we have to ensure we give support to the practitioners that are keeping it alive. Persons like June Frederick, Mr. Speaker, tremendous work that she's doing to make sure she keeps the masquerade alive, Mr. Speaker, and therefore we have to provide some support for them. During this year, we noticed, Mr. Speaker, that we need to improve our infrastructure for, for gatherings, mass gatherings. So we are investing in, in mobile toilets, Mr. Speaker. We are also investing in temporary seating. Um, if you can just imagine at Carnival, you know, thousands of persons at the SAB standing for six, seven hours. It discourages some of the older folks from coming out, and some persons who just want to take a seat while they, they view the show, there's no seat in there. So we will be investing in some upgrading and providing some, some of this, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, I, I want to move on quickly um, to tourism, Mr. Speaker. And you would have heard a lot being said in this honorable house, either through the Senate, and even when the member from Miko South is here, when he speaks about tourism. Mr. Speaker, if you listen to the narrative, they suggest that tourism is dying in St. Lucia. It's in crisis. It's going nowhere, Mr. Speaker. But you would have heard the member from Castles East in his budget statement give you some of the figures, and I'll come to the figures in a bit, Mr. Speaker. But I want to say to you, Mr. Speaker, this government, from day one, we said we were not going to be coming into this house, certainly not by me, the minister, boasting of figures, figures, figures. For us, what was more important was how we transform the industry to make sure that we can bring greater benefits to all communities and to all stakeholders. That was our dream. Of course, numbers are important, but what is, what is the value of the numbers if your people cannot benefit from it? If the benefits of tourism cannot filter across communities and across individuals. So we don't glorify in the numbers. We have the best numbers you've had in, ever. But that's not what really matters to us. It is how we are transforming the industry, using it as a tool of economic empowerment in our country. So, Mr. Speaker, in the coming year, we'll make, be making some strategic you know, advances. We've made some in the last couple of years, the Community Tourism um, Bill, the Tourism Development Act, Mr. Speaker. But we're now going to be confronting, Mr. Speaker, the fact that the world is changing so rapidly, Mr. Speaker, and we want to be at the forefront of it. So one of the first things we'll be doing, Mr. Speaker, is starting to incorporate artificial intelligence as a tool for us to understand how people make choices to, as to where to travel and what it is that would make them reach that decision to travel, what it is they need. So in a sense, we will become more sensitive to what the market requires of us. And you will see the St. Lucia Tourism Authority this year spending money, um, considerable amounts of money, Mr. Speaker, for us to explore the technology. I don't want to go into details now. We don't have time to really explain to you how the technology can work. But you'll be hearing a lot about the use of artificial intelligence, Mr. Speaker, in our tourism uh, marketing. Another big one, and the member from Grusili mentioned it. Many years ago, again, under, I think it was under the member from Castries East. He was Minister of Tourism. When we really started off in sports tourism, when we built the Bosejo Cricket Ground, we built the National Stadium. And he will tell you, we went to England promoting you know, St. Lucia, bringing on schools to come and take part in schools cricket in St. Lucia. We brought on county cricket teams, Mr. Speaker. There's a whole story behind that. One of these days, Mr. Speaker, he will share some of his experiences you know, with you about we promoting sports tourism. And over the years, and we even had hired Red Pereira as a sports consultant at the St. Lucia Tourist Board to help us develop sports tourism. We're going to go back into sports tourism in a big way. The investments that have been made now to upgrade Bosejo, um, and also the, the, the loan that we've taken, the one that was criticized by the member from Miku South, will be used, Mr. Speaker, to 
develop the infrastructure in all communities. Again, we have a very clear underlying principle in what we do. The benefits must spread across the communities and across individuals. So all the communities will see upgrades in, in their facilities. So they too, Mr. Speaker, can enjoy a piece of the pie. I have said in this house, I recall when we would bring down some of the, the schools and we take them, take them to Wen, we take them to Rudy John, we take them to La Fag. There are no toilet facilities, you know, uh, and it's embarrassing. You know, you bring down persons from overseas to play cricket and they want to use a facility and you have to go and check a neighbor that living by the field to use their, their facilities. You will see that qualitative improvement in the facilities in Central. We'll be building, Mr. Speaker, the aquatic center. Already St. Lucia is lined up for two major international swim meets with the, through the Swimming Association for next year, Mr. Speaker. We, I'm not sure if we'll be ready in time for it, but the potential is endless, Mr. Speaker. But we're going even one step further. St. Lucia will now explore associating with major international sporting events. So we're going to use sports in terms of bringing the sporting teams to St. Lucia, but we're also going to take St. Lucia out to be part of international sporting events. And I, I, I'm tempted to say sporting teams, but the member from Castles East might tell me, just make sure we don't sponsor Arsenal, Mr. Speaker. But the point is, Mr. Speaker, we are going to go very big, Mr. Speaker, in terms of destination branding, as well as you know, bringing St. Lucia, promoting St. Lucia as a premier um, sports tourism destination. The third point I, I, I want to highlight that will be major for us, Mr. Speaker. And sometimes you're told that when they have challenges, you must learn to make opportunities out of it. And I think that is the mindset we have. With the closure of the St. James Club, that's 300 and something rooms, with Mystic closing down, Starfish closing down, that's another almost 500 rooms. So almost 800 rooms will be out of the market. And we're going to have a big summer and winter this year. But 800 rooms will not be available. So we now have to start thinking of how we're going to accommodate all the persons who want to come to St. Lucia. So now is an opportunity for us to develop a, a real extensive marketing campaign to capture the home accommodation sector. And therefore, we will be going out in a very aggressive way for us to promote the home accommodation sector as a desirable option to come to St. Lucia. So the legacy of that, when all the rooms are coming back on stream and new rooms are coming in, our home accommodation sector would have created a niche marketing um, campaign for itself, Mr. Speaker. The other big one for us this year, Mr. Speaker, is that we're going to launch Virtual St. Lucia which really aims to transform the way travelers engage with, our, with St. Lucia as a destination. We, we believe, Mr. Speaker, that if all the growth we're going to have in rooms, Mr. Speaker, we need to find new ways to connect with the travelers. So through immersive virtual reality technology, St. Lucia will be positioned as the first virtual Caribbean island, Mr. Speaker, offering travelers an interactive platform to explore and book accommodations, therefore enriching their pre-travel experience. So basically, if somebody from overseas wants to come to St. Lucia, they'll be able to click on the hotel they want to, they, they, they're thinking of, they'll be able to actually walk through the rooms in the hotel, the kitchen, the public areas, and get a feel of using virtual technology of what that experience would be like but all from the comfort of their homes through the technology that we'll be using, Mr. Speaker. And we're working very hard and we'll soon launch it. Almost every aspect of St. Lucia, every major site, we will have a virtual reality um, available so visitors beforehand can experience what St. Lucia would be like virtually. So when they do come to St. Lucia, they already have a feel of what's going to be. And like I said, St. Lucia will be the first virtual um, destination in the Caribbean. And of course, Mr. Speaker, we will continue to market and promote St. Lucia um, in terms of our sustainable um, tourism, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I, I mentioned earlier we had passed the new Tourism Development Act, Mr. Speaker, and I made the point that we had a, a, a vision 
of making sure that the benefits of tourism are spread across the communities and across individuals. We believe that all St. Lucians must share the benefits of the tourism industry. And according to the legislation, Mr. Speaker, it is about promoting inclusive, resilient, and sustainable tourism development. And that is what we are about. And the Act will actually create the enabling framework for that to happen, Mr. Speaker. So during this year, we will be increasing the staffing component of the ministry. Because if we don't have the staffing, for us to be able to deliver on that vision, it, it will come to naught. So we'll start seeing some growth within the ministry and for us to be able, Mr. Speaker, to um, deliver. One of the first things we have to do, almost as a matter of priority, Mr. Speaker, is for us to have a proper certification program. When we say to the world that we are offering a particular standard, we have to be able to deliver it. We have to be. So we will be going throughout St. Lucia and implement an extensive certification um, program. We have to register all tourism operations within a two-year period. Within a two-year period. We'll start off with accommodation. We'll do food and beverage and visitor attractions this year and then we will eventually expand it. But we have to be able to ensure that we set standards that will deliver on what we promise individuals. They, there should be no visitor who said they were given a value proposition. They were told this is what the experience would be. But the standards of the food and, accommod the food and beverage, accommodation, this, the attractions are not at the level that we advertise. So the ministry will ensure that all the certification takes place, Mr. Speaker. Then there's the Tourism Development Fund, Mr. Speaker. You'd recall during the debate on the Act, I, I, I explain why this is important, Mr. Speaker. I am always reminded that the banana industry, Mr. Speaker, and I said so during the Jimmy's when, when I spoke, you know, we never you know, cherish and, uh, and promoted and recognize our outstanding banana farmers and other stakeholders, Mr. Speaker. And that industry has, has now ended and tourism is in the forefront. The Tourism Development Fund, Mr. Speaker, is really critical for us to have that mechanism where strategic initiatives in the tourism industry can be financed from, Mr. Speaker. And, and that for us is really important, Mr. Speaker, that the industry sets up that capacity, whether it might be a storm, a hurricane, and we need to rebound from it, then we would have the fund, Mr. Speaker. Whether there are specific issues in the tourism industry that we need to address, we would have a fund that has resources that we can draw from, Mr. Speaker. In a sense, it is tourism, funding tourism development, Mr. Speaker. And therefore, during the year, we will reclassify the levy so we can expand collection, Mr. Speaker, and we'll be able to build surpluses that can be deposited in um, the fund. M Mr. Speaker, research is important. So I've spoken about certification, I've spoken about the fund for financing, but we cannot move forward and we cannot be very clear where we're going if we don't even know what's happening around us. And in our part of the world, we do not put enough emphasis on research to actually find out what exactly is happening. And therefore, the ministry will be definitely putting some emphasis on gathering as much data and information and in conducting as much analysis as possible so we know precisely what's happening in the tourism industry and to help us guide where we're going, Mr. Speaker. Training is important. And I, a few months ago, I was in Soufre, and the member for Soufre, Mr. Speaker, she was organizing training for her craft, for her vendors, Mr. Speaker. And it really shows the importance of, of that aspect of the tourism industry. It's something all of us uh, will be involved in as the ministry undertakes a national tourism training program to ensure that different um, stakeholders, whether it is vendors, craft, whether it is the persons doing um, water taxi and um, road transport, um, tra transportation, Mr. Speaker, that we can train persons and make sure that the, the, the right standards are, are met, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Jimmy's continue to be a very important activity for us, and I'm really thankful to my colleagues who joined me a couple of weeks ago at the Jimmy's, Mr. Speaker. And I made a point earlier 
that we need to recognize the outstanding St. Lucia and those heroes that are making the tourism industry the success that it is. We have to, as a country, as a government, say thank you to them, recognize them, and inspire them to continue to deliver the highest standards of performance, Mr. Speaker. And the GMIS is exactly the platform for that. It was the second edition of the GMIS. I'm sure all who were there um, you know, had a, uh, had a good time, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and I want to thank them, Mr. Speaker, um, for, 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 for being there. So we will continue to use the GMIS as our premier uh, mechanism for recognition and celebration of our outstanding tourism um, you know, performers, Mr. S Speaker. The former hostess program, I, how many of you would probably remember, this was a program that existed before and it was stopped. But the hostesses program is an important program, Mr. Speaker. It's an opportunity for persons in St. Lucia to be out there providing support to, 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 to whether it is law enforcement, providing, um, you know, support to, to tour operators, visitors are moving around, they need somebody to, to probably guide them where to go, where not to go. It's a kind of a, a, a welcoming, you know, um, party in a sense that, you, you know, people are coming to your country and you have hostesses. We've now given it a very exciting and sexy name. We call it the Hospitality Ambassadors Program, Mr. Speaker. We don't call it the Hostess Program anymore. So they're really Hospitality Ambassadors and we will continue to work on it this year, expand it. So in all the, the, the favored places that visitors go, we will have St. Lucians who are welcoming them and offering them, you know, information and guidance. In terms of infrastructure project, Mr. Speaker, um, there's a lot going on, a lot going on. And during the estimates, I spoke about it. The Castries Box Park, Mr. Speaker, that's near completion, Mr. Speaker. The Srozel Art and Craft Center, Mr. Speaker. The Grosley Beach Park is about to finish, Mr. Speaker. And very shortly, we will be having a special ceremony for us to officially open it, Mr. Speaker. All of those infrastructural projects have add to the, the, the product of St. Lucia and certainly enhances the destination appeal. We've made a very special effort, Mr. Speaker, and this year is going to be one of our, our priorities, is for us to enhance recreational beach spaces. Think about it. St. Lucians go to the beach almost every weekend, and some persons during the week. Visitors go to the beach. Cruise passengers go to the beach. Tell me how many beaches in St. Lucia you can go to, and there are public facilities. Tell me. If you, if you really think about it. And we have to make a special effort for us to upgrade those um, recreational spaces and, and to make sure, Mr. Speaker, that where our people go for recreation, to take photos, to relax, Mr. Speaker, we offer the most comforting experience for them. Not just for visitors, but for our St. Lucians as well, Mr. Speaker. So you will see some upgrading taking place at Ridgeway Beach, Buckeye Beach Park, We'll be doing a new lookout at As Fair, Mr. Speaker. Marigold Bay is, is in line for a major upgrade, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mont Pimad, and I think um, in the next two to three weeks, we will have a sorted in ceremony at Mont Pimad for the new hotel development that will take place there. Part of that development is uh, a beach facility, Mr. Speaker. Of course, at the same time that you provide the beach facilities, um, you provide the facilities for vendors, you also create new opportunities for persons for economic activity, for vendors to sell craft, for food and beverage sale, and therefore it expands again the pie, you know, and, and more persons can benefit. I have to speak, Mr. Speaker, of the UBEC, Unleashing of the Blue Economy Project. This is a very significant project for us, Mr. Speaker, and the, the, the member from Castles East made mention of it during his budget statement, Mr. Speaker. We'll be using this project for a number of activities. First of all, the national tourism policy, uh, Mr. Speaker, which was, um, last, was adopted in 2003, 21 years old. We need to update it. And under this project, we will be getting the resources for us to update the, the national tourism policy. And having passed a new tourism development act, it is necessary for us now to move into that stage where we can formulate the policy and as well for us to come up with a, a master plan. Then, Mr. Speaker, you would know about the tourism um, transportation. 
for more than 15 years, we've had a moratorium on the issuance of TX plates in St. Lucia. And I've explained to this house, and certainly in the estimates, that we had a three-phase approach. One, to reissue existing TXs. Two, to convert H to TX. And the third stage is for us to determine how many new TXs we are going to issue. And under the UBEC, we are getting funding for us to do a demand study for tourism transportation. And it will indicate to us how many more TXs that are needed in St. Lucia, Mr. Speaker. I spoke earlier of some of the projects that are near completion, the infrastructural projects that enhance our brand offering and, and improve um, the, of the experiences in St. Lucia. So you will see, Mr. Speaker, over the next um, year and into the next two years, an extensive investment by this government to ensure that the tourism infrastructure in this country is, is enlarging. We have, for example, in Masha, the Masha Artisan Village, which will be a real special creation. We're waiting on the uh, member for Castries East to give us some further guidance as to exactly how he wants it designed. We've seen some of the first um, versions of it, Mr. Speaker. But it will be special because it will be a real artisan village. You don't go there as a retail outlet to just go and buy t-shirts and buy craft. It will be an experience where you actually witness production taking place. At the same time, you can purchase. So if you can go there and you want a pair of sandals, the, the leather work person, uh, leather craft person will be actually making the sandal in front of you, taking your measurements, customizing it, and making sandals for you. If you want a leather belt, it can be made for you right there. If you want braids, and even hairdressers, so if you want a certain hairstyle, because some of the visitors who come in love the, the braids and the hairstyles um, our people have, you can actually sit there and it will be done for you, whatnot. So it, it will be, sorry? <laughs> Mr. Seeker. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, another exciting project um, is the Underwater Sculpture Park. And I, I must tell you, Mr. Speaker, this one really excites me. The more I read about it, the more the team reports to me on the, the, the progress we're making, the more I get excited about it. The only thing is that the closer it gets to ancillary. So, Mr. Speaker, <laughs> you know, I, I'm really excited because it, it has to be located in an area where there can be both diving and snorkeling. So it, it cannot be an area that is too deep. But it also has to be an area that offers clear water and there is not tremendous wave action. So, so for us, Mr. Speaker, we, we, you, have a, you have a place. Yeah. The, the Underwater Sculpture Park must tell a story, a story about St. Lucia, who we are as a people, what we've achieved, and where we are going. And therefore, for us, it's important. I think a good compromise might be for us to have more than one sculpture park. Maybe, you know, one Dong and Slurry and one further north, Mr. Speaker. Um, another big issue for us, Mr. Speaker, are the lookout points in St. Lucia. You know, as, as visitors land, say, in the south and they drive northwards, or visitors come to St. Lucia and they want to do an island tour, there are strategic places they stop to take out photos and for them to just relax. Sometimes they want to just use a washroom, and, and so they, they're not always available. So we are looking at a number of strategic lookout points around St. Lucia that we can build up. So ancillary, canneries, the insufre near the World Heritage Monument, you know, and as you go around the island, strategic areas where we can invest. In Babono has one, um, near Plat is it by, by Plateau area? The, but the team has located a number of strategic Mr. Speaker, lookout spots that will upgrade. It will offer, you know, recreational facilities, uh, vending facilities, and create an experience and a vibe. Each one unique in itself, Mr. Speaker. We'll be doing a lot in Viewfort in the coming year, Mr. Speaker. Viewfort and the member from Viewfort South is not here, but we are sh going to be shifting our sites to Viewfort. There's a lot we have to be doing in Viewfort. The member from Castries East has already stated that we will be renovating the f old fish market into a creative arts you know, center. We're going to build a boardwalk to the old fish, to the fisheries complex so persons can enjoy the waterfront. We're looking at um, doing some work with Mola Sheik, Mr. Speaker. A few years ago, they used to use it as a site for weddings and for sightseeing. So we will be investing in upgrading um, you know, what exists there to really make it an opportunity again for persons to go there for weddings, for, for picnic, for sightseeing, Mr. Speaker. And the fourth one we're looking at is where the old lobster, lobster port area at the head of the, the runway. 
um, that area we want to engage all the stakeholders and for us to redevelop that area and give it a, a real special feel, something that's reflective of Viewfort and of the experience. So we have at least four projects um, for Viewfort um, during the year, Mr. Speaker. So I'm sure the member from Viewfort South will be happy with this. Um, with the Ministry of Education, we'll be doing quite a lot, Mr. Speaker. Um, and if you think about it, if tourism will become a tool of economic empowerment, we need to start preparing our people to see the opportunities and to take the opportunities when they come. It cannot be that our people see themselves as very limited in what they can achieve career-wise or in terms of economic and business opportunities. So from very early we want to go out to the schools so we can start raising the profile of tourism in the schools, Mr. Speaker, speak to teachers, um, do lectures, and to really try to de um, demystify in a way what the tourism industry is all about. The tourism industry is not about foreigners just coming and building hotels in St. Lucia and taking away our money and going overseas with it. And St. Lucians just being waiters and, and bad boys and whatnot. It's a lot more than that. There are a lot more opportunities. And we want to work in the schools, Mr. Speaker. We have our national tourism speaking, public speaking competition that will continue, Mr. Speaker. We want to start off with a, a tourism youth summer camp for students ages 8 to 10. So we can start, Mr. Speaker, introducing tourism education to them for them to actually experience some of the tourism um, offerings we have in St. Lucia. So they can visit hotels, they can visit um, cruise ships, you know, they can go to restaurants and they can actually get a, 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 re, a real view of what tourism is, is all about. And of course, we're going to be launching what we call a Tourism Gives Back program, where we will be supporting children of disadvantaged backgrounds. You know, it's not enough, Mr. Speaker, for us to talk about how you know, wonderful tourism is and all that it delivers, and we're not making sure that it is delivering, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I want to share with you a valuable piece of information. And almost every Monday we go to Cabinet, you know, and as Minister, I present memos asking cabinets for concessions and incentives. And sometimes I'm silently, you know, a little trepidation because it's, it always, it comes on week after week. Persons are investing in this industry. And in the last two years, we've seen a significant increase, Mr. Speaker, in the request for concessions and incentives. So I can say to, to this honorable house, in the last year, there were 37 projects approved by cabinet between January and December 2023. 17 projects were approved, pursuing one to the Tourism Incentives Act, and another 17 under the Tourism Stimulus and Investment Act. Three, of, three other projects were made under the Customs Control and Management Act. The total projected investment amount was $554,874,850. That's easy. So let's get it again. Just over half a billion dollars, Mr. Speaker. Half a billion dollars, easy dollars in investment last year alone. 37 projects, Mr. Speaker. 37 projects. The employment expected, Mr. Speaker, during um, post, when it goes into operation, it would employ an additional 2,186 persons would be employed. And during construction, 1,085 persons were employed. So it shows you the impact that the tourism industry has in terms of driving investment in this country. Just over half a billion dollars in one year in terms of incentives and concessions, you know, um, well, for projects investing in St. Lucia. Mr. Speaker, community tourism for us is a flagship. It is an initiative that, Mr. Speaker, we believe can really transform the tourism industry. Yes, we are giving concessions and incentives to the big hotels, the restaurants, but the community tourism you know, program, Mr. Speaker, really hits to the core of the kind of tourism we want to have in St. Lucia. We don't want a tourism that's a Miami beach tourism with big hotels on the beaches and whatnot. We want a tourism that is charming, that is sophisticated, Mr. Speaker, and that really says 
a lot about our personality as a people, Mr. Speaker. And therefore, the Community Tourism uh, Agency has been asked to develop a three-year strategic plan that focuses on what our vision is. We want a tourism that brings benefits all the way down to the communities, across all individuals. And we want tourism, the community tourism, to achieve that. So they've been asked to do a three-year um, strategic plan that shows us the roadmap to, to, to reach there. Mr. Speaker. You know, Governor, Mrs. you have 10 minutes left. How many? 10. 10? OK, Mr. Speaker. So th there's a lot that will happen in community tourism, um, Mr. Speaker. Um, in terms of numbers, Mr. Speaker, let me just say quite quickly, Mr. Speaker, that, and I want to first make the point, Mr. Speaker, that despite all the talk about our numbers and all the talk about, you know, Mr. Speaker, how tourism is in crisis in St. Lucia, last year, 2023, our arrivals were up 6.9% over 2022. 6.9%. Mr. Speaker, and if you look at the Social Economic Review, page 107, Mr. Speaker, you will get all the data on the arrivals. But even more remarkable, Mr. Speaker, more remarkable is yet to date to match, Mr. Speaker. All the main markets, Mr. Speaker, are showing an increase over 2023. So let's get that right. In 2023, we had a 6.9 increase over 2022. And already, January, February, March, all our numbers are up over 2023. So the US is up by 10%, the UK is up by 2%, the Caribbean is up by 63%, Canada is up by 8%. Compared January 2023 to January 2024, we are up 11% already. 11% already. And most remarkably, Mr. Speaker, we are 5% higher than 2019, which was the best year on record in St. Lucia. And yet, they spell a story of doom, that St. Lucia tourism does not know where it is going. But let me also give you another statistic. The month of March was the best month in the history of St. Lucia for arrivals. In the history of St. Lucia, ever. From time they started taking statistics in St. Lucia, the month of March. But yet, you will see somebody made a fake v um, TikTok clip and circulating it, saying all the reasons why you should not go to St. Lucia. And they did not even use, they did not even use a live person. They used a computer-generated voice. Just to betray the maliciousness of the clip, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, I can tell you about Elif. Last year, we had a slight problem with Elif because planes were not available, crew not available, and they crucified us all over the place, destroying the image of St. Lucia. This year, Mr. Speaker, we have 113,000 more seats than 2023, Mr. Speaker. Yes, Mr. Speaker, you know, we expected, Mr. Speaker, to have a very good um, summer, a very good winter coming, Mr. Speaker. I want to say quickly, Mr. Speaker, the National Conservation Agency um, Authority was placed under the Ministry of Tourism to allow us to have greater you know, um, chemistry and synergy in how we do our business. Um, two major initiatives for the coming year. The NCA will be given um, more roving teams so they can actually move around and cover more of the protected beaches and areas in, in St. Lucia. And very importantly, Mr. Speaker, we will be um, reviving the Rangers program. And those of you who remember, the Rangers program was a program started by the member from Castries East many years ago to provide support to learn law enforcement to make sure that our tourism areas are protected, our tourism areas um, receive you know, all the support um, necessary. So, Mr. Speaker, that, Mr. Speaker, it will be revived. Mr. Speaker, I have so much to say about investment. I've not even spoken about investment in the country yet, Mr. Speaker. I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, quickly, um, since I have about 15 minutes left, Mr. Speaker, that Firstly, Mr. Speaker, um, we have identified an investor, an investor, Mr. Speaker, um, who will be designing 
building and operating a new boat yard in Gantas Bay, Mr. Speaker. It will also include a new ferry terminal. And we have the investor, we've been discussing it. We now sit in a slasper, ISL, and the developer so we can put together the joint venture. And once we get all the approvals, you will, the ferry terminal will be located on the other side, Mr. Speaker, and a boat yard will be built there, Mr. Speaker. It's expected to cost about seven million US dollars. Mr. Speaker, I have to say, um, in Caldesac, Mr. Speaker, we have plans and ISL is already finalizing the drawings and the costings to build a youth creativity park in Caldesac. I've uh, spoken to the senior minister about it, as well as an entertainment center that can hold up to 10,000 people for mass crowds events. The days when we go to the Saab and we destroy the Saab, we go to Darren Sami and destroy Darren Sami, Mr. Speaker, we need a dedicated entertainment center in St. Lucia and we've asked ISL to design it and to come up with the costings. So between a, a youth creativity park, now the youth creativity park, Mr. Speaker, has to be special. It has to be a place where young people can go with a number of incubator facilities where they can start their own small businesses. Young people. It has to be colorful, it has to be vibrant, it has to be exciting, where our young people can go and rent space for a day and have a, a, a day office. They can have meetings, they can start their businesses. The Youth Economy Agency can, can use it as an incubator, Mr. Speaker. And of course, as I said, the um, education um, center, Mr. Speaker. We have a major uh, manufacturer who is looking to build a, a, a factory in St. Lucia to expand their business. And the member from Cassius East had spoken about the mega investment bill. And once we can get that bill passed through the House and it will be coming shortly, that investor can move forward with it. I have to say, Mr. Speaker, a very exciting development. We've sat down and we've reflected on the BPO, the call centers. And we want to change our approach to how the call centers uh, promoted and, and established in St. Lucia. We want to make them smaller and more community-based. So rather than all the consult, cons, call centers in the north and all in the south, the next call center we're working on will be in ancillary. It will be a small facility, you know, maybe about 200 employees, but we're going to build one in ancillary. We've already identified the land. We now doing the designs and the costings. We already have an investor who is going to come and use the facility and set up a joint venture. I think the second one we're looking at is Denry, near the Denry Industrial Estate somewhere where in, in that area where we can do one. And we're already talking to an investor who will be doing so, Mr. Speaker. So um, hopefully you will see a number of those BPOs around St. Lucia rather than concentrating them because it's so difficult for persons to have to go transportation to work and back. Mr. Speaker, then a major project we're working on is the Brand St. Lucia headquarters flagship building. And it is likely to be located next to the new hotel at Point Seraphine, a six-story building that will encompass Export St. Lucia. It will encompass CIP, um, Invest St. Lucia, Tourism Authority. All the agencies that are out there promoting the brand of St. Lucia will be placed in, in one building, Mr. Speaker. I think it will cost about 27 million US, Mr. Speaker. The redevelopment of Point Seraphine, we're very close to signing off with an investor to redesign and modernize Point Seraphine. It, it is a little um, you're tired now, Mr. Speaker. You will see, Mr. Speaker, more being said very soon about Marriott residences, which will be a, a development where the old Red Lion Hotel at the end of the airport used to be, Mr. Speaker. The developer has already obtained the land. The drawings are now going to go to this year, Mr. Speaker, for Marriott to build some residences there. So, Mr. Speaker, that brings me quite quickly to just one more area, Mr. Speaker, the Citizenship by Investment Program. Now, Mr. Speaker, the member from Castles is a prime minister in his presentation, spoke about the Citizenship by Investment Program. And a lot has been said by my colleagues expressing support for the action taken. I want St. Lucians to, to, to reflect on what the prime minister said in his address. And I wish that section of his presentation can really be clipped and circulated for us to really focus on what the prime minister was saying. There we are in St. Lucia. When we launched the CIP in 2016, 
We, and we, our vision of the CIP then was that St. Lucia was not going to go into this notion that some people had that we were selling passports. We were not going to go into this. We wanted to use the CIP as a strategic tool for us to attract investment and bring in revenue to the country. But we wanted to do it not in a way where it is transactional, that people just do it to get a passport or pay money. We wanted it to be interactional. So we wanted it to be selective, exclusive, and highly valued. That, that was our view. We were not going to be making money at any cost, anywhere. That was not the intention. So we put in our legislation a maximum of 900, 500 a year, a minimum cost of 200,000. You had to have a net worth of $3 million. All names had to be published. Um, all escrows had to be local. We put in a number of checks and balances in, in there. Of course, the last government changed all of that. They changed all of that. They brought down the, the, the prices. Every time they made a change, we came to this house, we, sub, we filed a motion, a negative resolution, to ask for a debate on it, to say to them, we think you are going the wrong way. On every instance, they explained to us that the industry was changing and they thought they had to do it, they, and they, they went about and they did what they did. When we set it up, we actually employed what we call a relationship officer, whose role was to contact every new citizen and to make them build a relationship with St. Lucia. That's what we thought then. We call it beyond the passport. We did not see ourselves as selling passports. That, that was the vision. It was changed by the last government. Of course, when we came into office in July 2021, one of the first things we did was to review the industry, review the market. And then we realized that every other country had made substantial amounts of money in terms of the CIP program. But also importantly, they had been able to bring, to build extensive infrastructure using their CIPs. They built roads, housing, they built hospitals. I mean, one country is even building an airport now, e hotels, extensive. And then we studied what was the best way in which we can benefit from the industry. Noting the changes that had taken place made what we were offering in 2015 almost impossible to go back to because the industry had changed so much. So we had to find the best way for us to fit in there. And we went out, we introduced a new option, the infrastructure option. We got investors that are prepared to do housing. In fact, we've already made arrangements for Rock Hall, Belvide and Canaries, the, the National Road Infrastructure Program, the Community Infrastructure Program, and we are ready to roll with our programs so St. Lucia now can achieve some of the successes that some of those islands achieve. We always maintain that the program must rest on a solid foundation of due diligence, robust and rigid due diligence. I will not speak ill about any other country. We don't, that's not how we do business here in St. Lucia or of any other company or anybody else. We don't operate like this. But we made sure that St. Lucia did the right things. And then, of course, the suggestion to sign the MOA as something which is necessary to face, to respond to some of the challenges the industry face. And we said to them, everything in there, we're already doing it. Everything. We have no problems with that. What you're implementing now, we already have it in place. The one clause we had an issue with was the, the 200,000 because we had just signed our, our contracts. So allow us to run out those contracts and we'll join you. But if we could not get that, should we abandon the national interest of St. Lucia? Should we abandon it? We have a responsibility as the elected leaders to safeguard the national interest of St. Lucia. And the action we took is not in defiance of our regional colleagues. We believe in re regionalism. We all offsprings of this region. But St. Lucia's national interest is also important. And we were prepared to compromise on it. So we made the decision we felt that is best in the interest of St. Lucia. But what does the opposition do? They join up with all nefarious characters and individuals and, and media outlets to desecrate St. Lucia. But do you know why? Forget they don't want to see St. Lucia prosper unless it's under them. But for them, if this works, if we make a success of it, that's it for them. That's what frightens them. That's why they cannot sleep at night. Because if this Labour Party government 
can build hundreds and maybe thousands of rooms of homes in this country, what would he do to them? What if the member from Ansari Canneries can transform Canneries and Belvedere with a modern village at Belvedere? What if? What if the roads around this country can be repaired and rehabilitated? What if? And what if the Minister of Finance can get so much more revenue to meet all the social challenges we have in this country? What if? And I think they got scared. You're queer, sir. So they, for them, their best option is to go out and desecrate St. Lucia. Try to destroy us as a country. Destroy our reputation. And they attack me every day, Mr. Speaker. Every single day. But you know what? I'm very focused. I'm doing the work of my father. You know, I know what this is about. And no matter what side they're from and what their attacks are, Mr. Speaker, I am staying focused, Mr. Speaker. Very focused, Mr. Speaker. I am in this for public service. I've been in it from a teenager. The man from Castles North Carolina will tell you, our days outside the Paris Centre as teenagers, having youth group meetings, we've always been serving. And this is what it is about, serving the, the people of St. Lucia. And it will not deter us. It's not about that. It's about the hard work that we've put in, whether as young men in the student movement, in the youth movement, in community, and now at this highest level. This is what it's about. And they can say what they want about me. They can write whatever they want. I am staying focused. When my prime minister tells me to change course, I ask, where to now? That's it. If he tells me jump, I ask how high. And if I don't want to jump, I tell him, chief, relieve me. I don't want to. So I don't bother with all the things they say. But we're going to make a success of this. We are going to transform St. Lucia. We are going to create opportunities for our young men and young women. We will give them a better future. We will. The farmers, the fish and folk, we will create a better future for them. There will be more scholarships. We will get the health um, for all rights. We will do it. And they can criticize, and they can desecrate, and they can decry. We will be relentless in our focus to get it right for the people of St. Lucia. So, Prime Minister, I'm really proud to be associated with this budget. I'm really proud, colleagues, for us to be working together to deliver for the people of St. Lucia. So, Mr. Speaker, I, without any hesitation, support the Appropriation Bill 2024-2025. Thank you very much.